Hey everyone, how's it going? Today we're going to start out by talking about aircraft defense. What I mean by this is how an aircraft would defend itself from incoming enemy aircraft, and more specifically, how it would defend itself by itself. For your standard fighters, the typical quote-unquote defense would just to be agile, avoid the enemy, and shoot them down before they could shoot you down. A good offense is the best defense, after all. When you get to much larger and less agile planes, like bombers and whatnot, you typically have a full crew of several men on board, and as the plane isn't all that maneuverable, it would behoove them to have some kind of rear-facing and other outward-facing weapons. That's why on bombers and the like, you see ball turrets and tail gunners that point out in various directions to defend the plane. Now, for the subject of today's video, we have a bit of a different situation with a, quite frankly, insane solution. We have a smaller plane intended only for dive bombing. As dive bombers are typically much slower than your standard fighter or interceptor, they are much more vulnerable without extra defensive measures or escort aircraft. As a result, for a great deal of dive bombers to help defend against enemy fighters, a second crew member would be stationed just behind the pilot with a rear-facing machine gun or cannon. Just as this has its obvious reason to exist, it also has a rather obvious flaw. The tail section is in their way. If there is an enemy aircraft directly behind them, not only would the tail section obstruct their vision, they would technically risk shooting the tail, and most likely, the vertical fin. Doing so would at best hamper the plane, and at worst, lead to its destruction. So in came Nazi Germany, with their love of weird aircraft designs, to try and solve this problem of the tail being in their way. The way that they would solve this was rather unique. They would design a plane that had a vertically rotating tail. This is the Junkers Ju-187. As the designation Ju-187 would imply, this new dive bomber was intended to be the replacement of probably one of the most famous dive bombers from the era, the Ju-87 Stuka, well known for its iconic siren while in a dive. While the Stuka was well regarded and saw incredible success early on in the war, in the invasion of Poland, and in the invasion of France, and some significant success throughout the war to not sell it short, the Battle of Britain and subsequent fighting would demonstrate how vulnerable the Ju-87 was to enemy fighters. Stukas were just too slow at just 211 miles an hour max speed at sea level, and not at all agile enough to survive on their own or in skies that weren't completely dominated by other Luftwaffe planes so a significant upgrade was sought. The rapid advancement of aircraft technology seen throughout the war made the original Stuka technologically obsolete pretty quick, even if it did have later success. The new Ju-187 would be faster, better armed, and better armored, a full upgrade over the Stuka. The date that the Ju-187 was designed or conceived is not known, as far as I can tell, but considering that it came about as a result of the Battle of Britain, it is safe to assume that it was designed sometime in late 1940 or early 1941. This new design would keep the most prominent feature of the Stuka, the inverted gull wings that conceptually allowed it to have a larger bomb payload, among other things. The new design would also bring some much-needed upgrades to the original Stuka design. The original had fixed landing gear, which, while technologically and mechanically easier to make and maintain, served as two major points that would reduce the overall aerodynamics of the plane. The new 187 would have retractable landing gear that would improve the plane's aerodynamics and lead to increased speed and overall performance. Additionally, the engine of the 187 would be a step above the original Stuka, replacing the Junkers Jumo 211 with 1,200 horsepower with the Junkers Jumo 213 with 1,776 horsepower. 
This brought up the top speed of the 187 to around 250 miles an hour at sea level. Additionally, the overall firepower of the 187 would be substantially greater than the Stuka. I should quickly note here that for these comparisons, I'm comparing the 187 to the JU-87B, which was the first variant of the Stuka to be mass-produced. Anyway, for its weaponry, the Stuka would have two forward-facing 7.92mm MG-17 machine guns, one rear-facing 7.92mm MG-15 machine gun, one 550-pound bomb under the fuselage, and four 110-pound bombs under the wings. Not a bad set of weaponry by all means, but the 187 would blow that out of the water. Having two forward-facing 20mm MG-151 cannons, one rear-facing remote-controlled 13mm MG-131 machine gun, along with one rear-facing remote-controlled 15mm MG-151 cannon, along with one 2,200-pound bomb on the fuselage in a semi-recessed bay, four 550-pound bombs under the wings, and four 55-pound bombs on the tail. The 187 more than doubled the bomb capacity of the Stuka and had significantly stronger offensive and defensive guns. Adding to the improved defensive weapons, the 187 was to be given overall better armor as well. So, as far as weaponry and armor goes, the 187 would have been quite the powerhouse. The 187 would also make a small adjustment to help improve pilot vision. In what is the second most interesting design change, the nose of the 187 would be considerably more droopy than the Stuka giving the pilot just a bit of an increase to his field of view. It wouldn't be much, but every bit counts. And now we get to the design change that really makes the 187 stand out, the rotating tail. As previously stated, the purpose of this feature was to give the rear-facing crew member better visibility towards the rear of the plane, while also reducing the chance that they accidentally shot the tail somehow. Because of how the wheels and landing gear would be situated, the tail can only be rotated mid-flight. As the rear wheel was small and kept the tail low to the ground, rotating the tail on the ground simply wouldn't work. As for how rotating the tail would actually work, we do not know. Whether it would be done manually through some kind of crank system or mechanically through the push of a button is unknown. And it is unknown because they would never actually make a working model of the 187. In 1943, the 187 project would be abruptly cancelled just as a full-scale mock-up was in the works. There were two key reasons for this, one of which was the tail. Having such a unique design feature like this would certainly draw out the development time to unreasonable levels and would certainly require quite a lot of trial and error. Additionally, by that time, improvements to the Stuka through variants like the JU-87D and JU-87G would increase their performance to be on par with the expected performance of the 187 plus different variants of the BF-109 and FW-190 fighters had shown themselves to be relatively adept at dive bombing. Since the expected performance between the 187 and the Stuka wasn't expected to be all that different, and the Stuka was already tried and tested, it was decided that there was no real reason to continue work on the 187, so it was cancelled. Still, even though it was cancelled and never had a working prototype or took to the air or anything like that, we can at least speculate on how it would have performed. With the rotating tail design, I think a major sticking point would be the in-flight change of how the plane handled. As a little reminder, the vertical tail fin, mid-flight, would sort of swing downward in presumably a controlled fashion. This raises the question to me of how the plane would control while it's in the process of moving that fin. As it is only moving the vertical fin on a pivot and not the entirety of the tail section, as I previously thought it did, would there be any significant change in its handling? To ensure that the rudder could function as normal in both positions, 
it has to be set at a bit of an angle in its upright position, with the change between the two positions and, by effect, a change in how the rudder was oriented showed discernible differences in control. There is a lot that is fascinating about this tail concept that was unfortunately never found out. And with all these questions I have, though, I think that the tail rotation concept would have inevitably been scrapped in the end. Going forward with this rotating tail concept would mean that there would be both more things to manufacture and more points of mechanical failure. Generally speaking, for war production back then, you wanted things to be more simple, easier to manufacture, and easier to fix if broken. And doing this just adds an unnecessary layer of complexity to something that didn't really need it. For what little benefit it would have likely had, the mechanical and technological headache it would have caused was just not worth it. And clearly the Nazi government didn't think it was actually worth it either, so the 187 was cancelled. Still, the 187 lives on as a bizarre little footnote in the history of Junkers and the infamous Stuka dive bomber. Alright, and with that, I think we'll go ahead and end. So, thank you all for watching. Remember to like, comment, and subscribe. In all honesty, I kind of feel like the rotating tail concept is like something a little kid would come up with, you know? Like, look, the tail spins, isn't it cool? Billy's plane doesn't have that, so it makes me all special and cool. It's like the playground argument of World War II. But anyway, I hope you liked the video, and at the very least, I hope you learned something. So, see ya.